Great. Why don't we just pray before we start? Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this Bible passage, Lord Jesus. We thank you uh, that you speak um, to us through it. We pray that you'd open our eyes and ears and our hearts, that we would hear your voice, that we'd experience you, and we would know what to do with it, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. I just want to add my uh, welcome to Libby's. If I've not met you, uh, if you're visiting, if you're new, my name's Paul. I'm one of the associate ministers here at the church. Do come and say hello at the end. It'd be great uh, to get to know you. It's a great uh, passage that Emily's just read, thinking about Micah speaking to the people of God, challenging their behavior as they worship God and they live for God, just trying to tweak and change some of the things to confront and speak out to them of how they're living, what they're doing. And as I was preparing this, thinking about this, I was reminded of a story uh, that I heard about my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. Uh, She didn't tell me this, but somebody else told me about her. And my wife was at a a youth conference, uh, similar to sort of Soul Survivor. Lots of young people come in. They're all worshiping God. They're all going for it. They've all come with their church youth group. They've brought their Bibles and their notebooks. They're keen to learn. They're keen to grow in their faith. They want to come and they want to be transformed. They want to leave the conference differently from what they were when they came because they've encountered God, encountered the Spirit. They're there on a journey. And in the midst of all of that, and in the context of worship, in the context of a, of a conference, Katie was with a group of young people that she'd brought. And she kind of uh, just arrived, they took their backpacks off and stuff, and they put them down in the corner there. And the young people were kind of socializing and probably flirting, as teenagers probably just do at the sort of conferences. You know, they're trying to network and look who's in the room and all that sorts of stuff. And they got talking to some of the youths, and Katie's kind of a bit like, I'll just kind of like be on the side here and not try to be awkward. But Katie had noticed a couple of guys, and they weren't looking at the group that Katie had brought. They were looking at the bags that they'd put down in the corner. And she was like, that's a bit strange. Why are they fixating on all the backpacks and all their possessions and all the stuff that they'd brought? It's a bit weird, but she didn't want to be suspicious. It's a Christian conference. We all love the Lord. We're all children of God. It's all very nice. So anyway, she was like, forget that, rebuke that thought. Anyway, she kind of carried on. But she couldn't shake the fact that they were moving closer and closer to the bags. And she's like, this is a little bit suspicious. It's a little bit awkward. So she kind of gave a bit of space and kind of stood back. And surely enough, these young people on this Christian worship conference came and went through their bags opened the bags, went through stuff, and actually took some of the bags, put them on their backs, and walked off with the young people's bags that weren't. They were basically stealing the rucksacks. And something inside Katie was like, that is just wrong. Like, that is not right. So Katie chases after these boys, and she's like, stop, guys. They are not your bags. Give them bags back. She pulls the bags off them. She takes them back and puts them down. Now, when I heard that, I was like, wow, feisty. But I quite like that. I was like, something inside is like, that's just not right. Like, this, is, this, this shouldn't happen. That behavior is wrong. You'll know when we see something, when we watch something, when we experience something that's just unjust, something that's just not right, something that just shouldn't be. And something inside us rises up, doesn't it? And there's moments where we can't help but speak out. It would actually be wrong to not speak out. We've just got to say something and do something. The prophet Micah has to say something. He speaks out on behalf of God. Now, you've got to um, look at prophecy and the, the, the office of a prophet. You've got the Old Testament and you've got the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are these prophets that kind of rise up. And it's like they're the kind of mouthpiece of God. They're speaking to the people of God. It's big, loud, clear, bold instructions. Almost like, thus saith the Lord. Have I not said, declares the Lord. They're big sort of prophets in the Old Testament. You've got the New Testament. And there's almost like this level of humanity. You've got the Apostle Paul saying, look, we know in part. We see in part. We prophesy in part. Prophecies should be weighed. They should be tested. They should be kind of like sifted through. There's a kind of an element of humanity in this. These prophets in the Old Testament, they're speaking these big things of God. Old Testament prophet Micah is one of them. But you know, he's not a lone voice in the Old Testament. He's not just somebody that's kind of speaking on behalf of God to the people of God to tweak and change their behavior or challenge them or rebuke them. He's a voice of many in the Old Testament. Look at at Isaiah. For I, the Lord, 
For thus saith the Lord, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. It's another voice in the Old Testament speaking out. Other voices in the Old Testament that speak out to the people of God, instruct the people of God of how to live and how to be. Let's look at Amos. Amos, another prophet challenging the people of God. Now, this is from the message translation, so it's a bit colorful. It's a bit fruity, but here it goes. It says this. I can't stand your religious meetings, declares the Lord. I'm fed up with your conferences and your conventions. I want nothing to do with your religious projects and your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all that I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want, says the Lord? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. That's Amos speaking there to the people of God. At the Justice Conference that Simi and I have just been to, there was a speaker there, a church leader from Seattle, and he says something similar in his words. He says, if we reduce church to a 90-minute session on a Sunday, if all of this is for nothing outside of here, If it doesn't affect our day-to-day, it's a show. Micah is speaking to the people of God. He's speaking out to them. And he's saying, guys, wake up. What you do on your day-to-day is is, is so vitally important. It's not just about your religious acts, the things that you do that look good and so on. It's about living out your faith in your day-to-day. When you read commentaries about Micah uh, and this passage, one of the commentaries uh, says this about Micah. He says this, he says, Micah had the gift of seeing and revealing hidden things which the common person couldn't see. Now, in some ways, that feels like both a blessing and a burden, right? It's like he's seen things that should be but are not, and he's kind of longing for the kingdom to come, but, but it's not kind of here. It's like he sees what they should be like, but it doesn't kind of measure up. But Micah can imagine he can see what it should be like, how the people of God should be, and they're not being like that. They're just not cutting it. Walter Brueggemann is um, an Old Testament scholar, and he looks through um, the prophets. He, He mainly focuses on Jeremiah, but he looks at these Old Testament prophets and what they were saying and how they uh, address the people of God. And he uses this phrase, prophetic imagination. That the prophets had prophetic imagination. It's like they could imagine how people should live. They should imagine what the kingdom of God should look like. They should imagine, they would imagine prophetically what it would look like if we loved people the way Jesus did, if we um, acted justly, if we loved mercy, if we did it in relationship with God. They had prophetic imagination. And if we can see, we can imagine our workplaces, our homes, our families, and we could just imagine, oh Lord, what, what would it look like if your kingdom was to come? If we were to live out our faith and see your kingdom break out, what would it look like? Just allow God to allow us to imagine and dream a little bit. So in the context of worship and justice, Micah is speaking to the people of God. We come to verse 8 and it says this. He says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? Now that's an interesting word, isn't it? Require. What does the Lord require of the people of God Maybe at work, you know, you have a few requirements as an employer or employee. There's things that's required of you at work. So you kind of start at a certain time. You finish at a certain time. You might have a contract that you kind of follow. You're required to be respectful. You're required to get on with your work leagues, to to act justly, to treat people fairly. You're required to do certain things at work. Maybe as as a parent or as a, as, a, as a godparent, or an auntie, or an uncle, or something, but in, within a family setting, there's certain things that's required of us. We had the joy of having a, a baptism uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and just inviting children into the family of God, and making these sort of promises that we're going to bring the child up in a Christian context, to teach, and to love, and to show them the way of Jesus. 
what's required of you as, as a parent. But Mike is saying to the people of God, this is what is required of you. And, and it's not to read X amount of Old Testament scripture by a certain time. It's not to, to read the Bible in a year, all that's good. It's not to sing a certain amount of songs, although that's good. It's not to give X amount of money. Enough money might be required of you. It's none of that. He's saying this. This is what's required of you as people of God, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. See, the Old Testament prophets, they instructed the people of God how to live, but then Jesus came and he showed us how to live. The Old Testament prophets instructed the people of God, and then Jesus says, okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what it looks like to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk in relationship with the Father. Jesus comes and he serves the marginalized. He comes and he turns over the tables of corruption. And he, and he loves mercy. And he seeks mercy. And he seeks justice. And he speaks to it. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't step back from it. He steps in to it. And he lives out a life. He shows the people of God what the Old Testament prophets were just longing for. To live a life. This is it. Found in Jesus. Jesus shows us how to live. Now, we do this so well as a church. Think about what we do every Saturday with our Saturday meal. This is at Christmas, already set for the guests. 100, 100 plus every Saturday come in. Team of volunteers and people who just pour themselves out, who long to see um, the people brought home. Love mercy, act justly, do it humbly before their God and with God. This Thursday at B's and T's, there was a bake sale and all the money that they raised on the bake sale was to go to Tear Fund, another amazing organization seeking justice, loving mercy, getting people involved in the things of God. The week before last, Callum Mitchell and I went to a Salvation Army, and we saw some of the things that the MICA uh, fund has given to, some of the amazing projects, meeting people who've been addicted to drugs for 30 years and clean for 10. We saw the needle exchange van that's parked outside there as, as people give of themselves to try and seek people uh, brought into relationship with God, to love mercy and to seek and to speak to justice. Think about IGM. Libby has been away, hasn't she, to India uh, and the stories that are being fed in, in, from IGM, some of the amazing things that people are doing around the world. We could go on all morning about the incredible, amazing things that we do as we act justly and as we love mercy and we, we fight for justice as people together. Just recently, you know, they put out this stat that 204 people were rescued in a single day. These were modern day slaves that were working in a, in a brick making kiln. And there's even more than this uh, has been rescued since this stat. But just recently putting this out, it's just absolutely incredible. Absolutely great. And Micah is speaking about these things, that we act justly, we love mercy, we walk humbly with your God. Just want to draw attention to the word with. That's such an important word. It's not you act justly, therefore God will love you. You love mercy to be friends with God. You walk humbly so that God will accept you. But you do all these things in the context of doing it with God. You do it in relationship with God. You don't do it to earn his trust or his relationship, but you do it with him. God's doing this sort of stuff. He's at work in the world, and we get to partner with him. We get to join him in the renewal of all things. <coughs> This is a, a photograph of a photograph, so it's blurry. It's way back, probably in the 80s. Uh, this is my brother-in-law. And my brother-in-law, so now my father-in-law, invited um, Dave, my brother-in-law, to wash the caravan with him. And he talks about the moment where his dad walks in, in front of all his brothers and sisters, and he's like, hey, Dave, I need your help. And Dave's like, amazing. Like, what is he, like, three or four? He's like, dad needs my help. I need you to help me wash the caravan. Great. I'm getting my wellies on. I'm getting my little yellow anorak on. I'm going to put a baseball cap on backwards because it's cool because I'm helping dad. And I'm going to wash the caravan. How amazing that dad needs me to wash the caravan. Now, the reality of it is, he probably dropped the sponge a few times and picked it up and it's got dirt and stones in it and he probably scratched all the caravan and worked his way around the caravan and my father-in-law probably had to go around and clean up what he was doing. But the point is, his dad didn't need him to do it. He could have washed the caravan. He wanted him to do it. He wanted to wash the caravan with him. 
God maybe doesn't need, he could transform the world. He could do all these things. He's doing it. He wants to do it with us. He wants us to get involved. He wants us to get our hands dirty. He wants us to get our skin in the game. He wants us to speak to things and use our voice in the context that he's put us in. We did this together with God, didn't we? Uh, When we think about world vision and chosen, just absolutely incredible as we did this. And and that weekend that World Vision came and we sponsored children, just look at some of the stats. On that weekend, 217 children were sponsored. For every one child, it benefited four. The equivalent of £70,000 a year for the next 15 years from us as a family speaking to justice, injustice, saying this is something that we want to get behind, we want to love, and we want to show mercy. We want to get involved in what God is doing. Well, Simeon and I have just been away at the Justice Conference, and I'm going to invite Simeon to come up. Uh, let's give Simeon a round of applause. Coming up. Let you grab that. Now, Simeon has a degree. I've got to get this right. You've got a degree in ecological and environmental science. Is that right? I've done, well done. That's good. I remembered well. Um, now, Simeon, um, you are interning with us, which is great. I'll get you a mic. You're on number one because you don't want to shout. Um, Simeon is interning with us, is uh, interning under Transforming Society, uh, involved in Saturday Meal, but also um, your focus, really, your heart and stuff is caring for creation, isn't it? Just tell us a little bit some of the things that you've been doing so far uh, as an intern. What have you been helping us with? Yeah. Um, so firstly, I've been looking at some of the things that we've been doing already and the great things um, that's happened. So for example, um, us switching to renewable energy um, and been doing the eco congregation survey and looking at our uh, carbon footprint. And I've been chatting to people in the church and staff about what we're doing and partners such as Tear Fund and um, Edinburgh City Mission. A couple of weeks ago, we did, or a few weeks ago, we did a session with the uh, kids at the 11 a.m. Um, about caring for creation, and that went really well. Um, kind of a few things that are kind of in the pipeline or going to hope to do in the future is um, we're hoping to have a kind of a green travel or a low carbon Sunday. So we're going to encourage you um, all to kind of come to church from a different method of travel than usual. So if you're able to walk to church, that'd be amazing. If you're able to cycle, that'd be great. If you could bus um, or carpool. If, carpool if you're you know, further away, that would be uh, brilliant. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, and we're hoping to get more cycle racks for that as well. Um, we're hoping to show a documentary about how we can make peace with creation. And, um, yeah, and we're going to be start, or hoping to start a new connect group focused on uh, the environment, an eco-connect group. And um, a kind of another thing is we want to encourage people to get more in nature and connect with it. So we're hoping people to um, go into allotments and kind of grow some vegetables and food. So actually physically caring yeah, for creation and getting doing, your hands yeah. dirty. That's really exciting. And things just keep developing. Ideas keep forming and seems like, oh, what about this? What about that? We could ch- do this. We could do that, which is really, really inspiring and really great. I love all that. Now, we've just been uh, at the Justice Conference down in London. Some great speakers, uh, some great challenges, actually, as a church and as people. Like, what are we doing about this? How can we do this? And what can we get behind? And so on. But what was the kind of takeaway for you? Like, was there something that was kind of quite strong for you that you took away from that? Yeah. I mean, for me, um, the biggest take-home point was about prophetic imagination, which you've um, kind of touched on already. But the idea about act, lots of social justice or kind of social action movements um, are so focused about what we're against. So, you know, we're kind of being against slavery or against climate change or, you know, we're against certain things. But actually, if we are coming up with kind of the vision of what we're working to, imagining the world that we want to live in, of how we want God's kingdom to be, um, kind of working to do that and bringing people alongside, so kind of, kind of flipping it, putting it in the positive and kind of working towards that. I thought was quite amazing. That's great. Now, this is a, a really key verse for you. So um, over your life and over time, mm. Micah has been quite uh, important to you, this, this mm. passage, this text. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, so it was quite important to um, my family. When I was about um, 16, uh, we were living in Belgium at the time, and my family and I were kind of discerning about what to do next, and we're thinking about moving back to the UK. And um, 
so I was visiting a uh, school in Sheffield and I was looking around six forms at that time and there was this big building called the Johnson Building and with this big, um, a big kind of spiral staircase and as we keep going up this really big building on the top um, written on the wall and big was Micah 6 8 and I kind of knew that that was the right place for me to be um, and those kind of couple of years there was really important for me but as um, the kind of since I've kind of journeyed with that verse and um, you know what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy it kind of just shows how much it's on God's heart mm. um, and it's important to him but at the same time that we kind of walk humbly and do it with your God we're not doing it on our own and it's not about being you know, it's about doing it in righteousness, doing things in right relationships, not kind of self-righteousness on our own, mm. but being right with God, being right with others, with ourselves, and with the land. That's great. That's amazing. So finally then, what, because it's the context of worship and justice, but what does worship in God as a whole life disciple look like? Mm. I mean, th- for me, I think that we go throughout our daily lives, and there are so many decisions that we face all the time. And it can be really easy to kind of you know, forget um, that um, and how it affects God. And, um, you know, we, we constantly have um, yeah, decisions we face. So when we go into the supermarket, maybe we should think about, oh, you know, how do I, how am I worshipping God with this? Or, you know, what best to do when I worship God? Or when I leave the house and I travel, think about, you know, how best do I worship God when you use your time, when you use your money? How best can you worship God? So kind of... Um, yeah, putting a, putting a focus on that. They might seem like, you know, trivial things, um, but actually developing them as part of your rhythms of worship, um, I think is really important. That's great. Let's give, uh, well, before we give Simeon a round of applause, I'm just going to say a quick prayer for Simeon. That would be great. Father, thank you for Simeon, Lord. Thank you for his journey so far. Thank you for the, the verse, Lord, that's been so key, Lord, in their lives as a family, but as individually. And Lord, we thank you for all the ideas and all that is brought and implemented so far. We pray that you bless him, Lord Jesus, and that we would see so much more stuff get put into place that would be like trees that would be planted, that would grow and grow and bear much fruit. Lord, bless him. Thank you for him, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give Simeon a big round of applause. Thank you for being an intern, helping us. Now, one of the, uh, the things that, there was so many things within the Justice Conference, and there's so many ways that we can respond, and so many different causes and stuff that we can get behind and so on, but one thing that kept coming out that they almost focused on at a certain point was this whole thing around plastic, about caring for creation, and just speaking to, uh, to that really, and what that might look like. And it was really interesting at the Justice Conference, because whilst they weren't they didn't want to demonize a company. They actually highlighted a company that they wanted to encourage to think differently and creatively and to sort of inspire them to, to think differently about it. So they were looking at Coca-Cola, and they've set up this uh, campaign called the Rubbish Campaign, uh, and it's called Stop the Rubbish. But here's a little stat that they kind of brought to us at the uh, Justice Conference. that As a company, Coca-Cola, they produce 3 million tons of plastic packaging a year, equivalent to 108 billion bottles that's 200,000 bottles a minute. So if you set a timer on your phone for one minute, when the timer goes off, they've, they've produced 200,000 new plastic bottles. And we know that plastic is not great. We know that the pollution and the disease that can kind of be caused. And we're not trying to demonize them, but we're actually saying this is an area that we can speak to. This is an area that we say as people of God wanting to care for creation and love God's creation, like, this isn't great. How can we help you think differently? So T Funder actually meeting with Coca-Cola. Uh, this is a, a friend of mine's tweet that he's just put out. A guy from Auckland who works at T Fund actually. And he's kind of put this out, out there. So in a moment, we've got an opportunity. This is just one way that we can respond. There's so many things that we can get behind, isn't there? And, and speak truth to and speak life to. But Simeon's going to bring a, a table just to the front here. And Tear Fund have produced this thing. Now, it's on recycled paper. We've, we've done as little as we can, and there's a digital uh, response that you can do, so you can do it digitally as well. But um, there's a message in a bottle, and this is a message to Coca-Cola, just as, as people of God, to say, look, we love the creation that, that God's given us. We, we want to encourage you to think creatively, to think in a different way, and, and we want to encourage you just to write a message, a simple message there, to, to bring it back, pop it in there, and as a church, we'll post it to them. Uh, I, I'm doing this, I've asked my, um, my kids' school 
to do this. They're going to hopefully do this as a school as well. But just, just to, to be a voice, to speak to it, to speak to an area that we think we just want to see change in. We love God's creation uh, and all that he's doing. So um, I'm going to invite the band to come up. Let's do this in the context of worship because this is, it's a worshipful thing, isn't it? To say, God, how, how do you want me to engage in your creation? Uh, where we see areas where we can engage and get involved. So what I'd love you to do, do this worshipfully, but as the band play, I invite you just to come and just to come and collect one of these and maybe a pen if you need a pen and then go back to the balconies, make the journey down, get your steps in, come down uh, and write one of these uh, letters and just, just a brief note to it and then come and pop it in. And then if you want prayer for anything else, maybe as Libby said, there's an area at work where you just know somebody isn't being treated fairly. And you just want to stand and speak out to that. And you need the courage and the confidence to do that. Maybe you work for the NHS. You work uh, in, in government. Maybe you're at Holyrood. Maybe you're um, involved in, in the justice department. And you just love prayer for that. Or if you want prayer for anything else as well. As we worship and as we respond, come and get a, a piece of paper, write a letter. The prayer ministry team will be here. We'd love to pray for you as well. But why don't we stand and let's just respond. Come and get a letter. Uh, come and write and respond together. That would be great.